Embarking with nothing is harder than it sounds. Having no seeds or skills will slow things down, but overcoming that is actually the easy part. No axes means no woodcutting, no pick means no mining, and no anvil means no smithing. Just to make things harder, I'm not using any gear migrants bring, and I'm not trading until three enemy raids meet their end here. What's left for good dwarves to do? Can empty hands overcome the world's cruelty, or will the elvish bandits that left them here with nothing but a broken wagon and a couple of horses ultimately be the end of them? Rith doesn't have any skills yet, but she still leads most of the dwarves in training in case other bandits come looking for an easy target. Medtop starts working on instead filling some empty stomachs by breaking down the wagon into the only three logs they have to build with for the foreseeable future. He alone should be able to do all the work, gathering nearby plants, and cooking them into meals as the others train up. The Seven's only plan is that someone has to be coming to rescue them soon. Dwarves shouldn't be forced to wander to the other side of the river for a drink of disgustingly non-alcoholic water water. Their food is swarmed by flies and other vermin wander around the storage. There's no temples, no beds, no art. They have nothing but monotonous training and unfulfilling salads. No, no. There are plenty of settlements nearby. There's an abandoned monastery, a few human towns, and an elvish civilization to the north. Why haven't they sent any help? Why aren't they keeping the area clear of bandits in the first place? Perhaps they need a lesson on being more vigilant so that this doesn't happen to future travelers. It's not like such a large civilization is going to make miss whatever they're leaving out for dwarves to borrow. No one's used to sneaking around, but such a tiny hamlet shouldn't have armed guards that can kill unarmored dwarves either way. If they did die, Medtop would never know about it. Instead, he only has a few days of nervously tending to the campgrounds and trying not to think of the worst before everyone returns with bits of what they managed to steal. To teach the humans a lesson, uh, of course. It's only some thread and a bunch of armor unfortunately sized for big ugly humans, which doesn't really help dwarves lamenting their impoverished lifestyle. Perhaps the elves are no friends of real dwarves anyways. The bandits came from their people. Maybe they'll have some nicer food to unwittingly donate. Everyone returns quickly yet again, but they come back empty-handed. The dirty elves must not have had much. At least everyone's able to get in some training and get a little bit better at fighting in case stuff goes badly in the future. Oh god, that's a giant bear. Wait, it's tame? The animals lag behind, but the dwarves liberated a few new beasts, including a giant grizzly bear, from the elves. They could not have been treating them right if they came so willingly, but that bear is definitely getting trained for war in case the bandits come back or the elves come looking for their pets. The bear can actually be trained for stealth. A squad of sneaking dwarves comes in to steal from dirty elves before a bear as big as a dozen of them combined just tiptoes up behind them. Mm, yeah, no. The bear instead stays with Medtop so they can be trained up as everyone visits the nearby abandoned monastery to steal some old scrolls for reading material. Another raid directed at the elven retreat to the north ends up netting more giant creatures. What are the elves even doing with all these? The bird is butchered not for meat that spruces up meals, but for the bones that should be hollow but will still do for a basic crossbow at a bowyer shop that eventually has to be deconstructed so the singular log used to build it can be repurposed for a craft dwarf's workshop to eventually fasten bone bolts. They work for hunting wild bees to get some bones back and start making basic leather armor. A bunch of migrants expecting to need to walk much further arrive and Medhob explains what happened. They seem understanding enough about the raids, though they still pass uneasy glances no one blames them for. They'll see the necessity of wandering out to raid after being forced to drink water. Some brought weapons of their own, including axes, but those aren't going to be used to chop trees because, uh, alright look, I really just can't come up with a good lore reason. It would defeat the point of the challenge, so I'm forbidding these. The dwarves need to find an axe while raiding, or find an anvil and make one from scratch if they ever want to chop a tree down. A now larger squad leaves to show the newcomers that they're not really bandits and that they're just borrowing things while at a tough time in their lives. That leaves seven dwarves at the campgrounds, four of which are children, and three of which are adults that cook, craft, and hunt. They churn out bone bolts and turn tan hides into some basic leather gear to slowly outfit the adventurers as autumn arrives. Officials arrive almost by accident as they head towards where the outpost was supposed to be founded far to the east. The goblin liaison's unease is as obvious as bed tops. Why are the dwarves here? Why didn't they have guards escorting them through dangerous lands? The confusion only grows when the adventuring squad returns with more human gear and an iron pick in hand. The pick could be excused, human armor can't. With reports of bandit attacks on the rise from the human town to the west, the liaison puts two and two together. There'll be no trading and no salvation until he reports back to the king to discuss what should be done about the upset humans and elves. That leaves them with a 
pick, though it isn't quite as life-changing as it might initially seem. Sure, dwarves can finally dig into the ground, but without an anvil, they can't actually work metal. Instead, it's gonna allow them better living spaces, stone furniture, and some other lifestyle improvements. It'll take a while to mine all of it out, but after waiting more than half a year, waiting a little longer isn't too bad. The first human piggy bank seems to be running a bit dry, so dwarves turn their eyes on another small hamlet that can afford to lose some goods. Hopefully they have an axe and an anvil just lying around. The rest start turning stone into a variety of workshops to afford them those small comforts, including a sill to finally make alcohol. Before they actually make any booze though, the adventurers return with some booze the humans donated. Below ground, the first large spaces are turned into altars for general worship. Salir has the most worshippers here, but law, oaths, and marriage don't really fit. The dawn is more like it. They finally start making booze of their own almost a full year after arriving, then carve out an office on the level below the altars that no one's really fit to occupy. Maybe the next wave of migrants will bring a more natural leader. It's not like filling in the first official positions are that important for the moment. What is important is the new booze, which is best drunk in a modest tavern then slept off in private bedrooms. Things are shaping up, and the lesson is clear. Taking from others gets you nicer things. Well, at least some nicer things. The bedrooms to be won't have beds until they pillage an old axe some human left out. Unfortunately, the adventurers can't leave nearly as often. A new tavern invites supposedly independent spearmen looking for the source of the pilferings. Are they spies? Genuinely good people? Dwarves don't usually work on the surface, which is strange, but potentially good, right? The purported group of bandits would hide in some hard-to-find cave, not welcome visitors, right? The adventurers return and tell everyone that their raid went poorly in hushed whispers. They were caught, and though the dwarves got away unharmed, they had to kill both an elf and a human in their getaway. Investigations into murder are going to be a lot harsher than investigations into some petty theft work. The visiting soldiers seem fine though. They're telling stories and relaxing, not investigating and interrogating. In worse news, rumors about what's happening stop migrants from arriving. Foreign soldiers pass through as the investigations ramp up. This is becoming a regular occurrence. Tensions are high, war might be imminent. It's time for a change. The foreign soldiers have weapons that will add to the singular spear that currently constitutes the melee armory. The dwarves can't wear their ill-fitting armor. Dwarven soldiers burst into the tavern and fire away with bone crossbows. The chaotic brawl barely starts before it's over. With two dead humans and a dead dwarf, Medtop will have plenty to tell the ambassador while demanding safe haven. Can the homeland really stand idly by while overly aggressive humans come in and drunkenly start fights? The homeland ought to send squads to wipe the humans out and save the good dwarfs of Uzoldemat. The adventurers ask for a ranging guild to train up at in case the kingdom refuses to do what's right. Some more human soldiers arrive, but they buy the story about the humans starting it. Dwarven wine is notoriously strong. After they leave, dwarven adventurers can roam out to look for unwillingly donated goods for the first time in a while. The results are a mixed bag. They only stumble back to town nearly a month later. The report doesn't show up for some reason, but two dwarves are injured from what must have been a conflict. On the other hand, they brought back a proper anvil. There's coal below, meaning that one of these logs can be turned into plenty of coke for future metalworking. But that's going to take a back seat because the injured first need a hospital. One of the original workstations is deconstructed for a log used to make a bed. It's a shame the only people using it will be the injured in a hospital instead of at a dormitory, but it's where unfortunately necessary decisions have led. So the new supposed visitors are definitely just a hidden raid, right? There's so many of them and they're fully equipped, but no. They're just here to sit in the tavern while they continue their investigation. Do they suspect the dwarves here? Are they looking for the dead humans that met their end? Things will be bad if they do get violent. There are as many of them as there are dwarves, and they're much better equipped. Instead, dwarves fight injuries. Another bucket eats the second of three logs after deconstructing the other starting workstations, but even two buckets in the hospital isn't enough. That third log is the key to fueling metalworking, but what good is a society that can't even treat the sick? It gets turned not into coke, but into another bucket. There's another way to get metalworking underway deep in the ground that means the anvil won't see any use just yet, but can see use in the future. Right now, it's stashed away. No reason to let the outpost liaison see an anvils appeared out of nowhere like they did with the pickaxe last year. Let them see a fancy guild hall so that they know that Uzoldemont is an economic powerhouse that the homeland can't afford to lose to the elves, even if cheap stone statues somewhat undercut their point. Instead of a diplomat, elves arrive. A squad of five rogues demand vengeance for their murdered friends. Initial plans to make the humans still here fight the fight and solve both problems at once go poorly. Plenty of dwarves are still vulnerable outside and those elves are too close. The soldiers join the fray. Powerful bolts and heavy swings kill elf after elf through their flimsy wooden armor. Another squad of them shows up while the first is 
still getting killed off, join the fray, but meet the same fate without killing a single dwarf. The human adventurers down below wonder why elves attack, though the friendly giant bear gives them an answer of sort despite Medtob's assurances that they liberated the beast. The liaison arrives, but after seeing all the dead elves out front, are already unimpressed. They say hello, but share little information and a lot of the human suspicions. The homeland promised elves that dwarves wouldn't make any more weapons, including bone crossbows. If they do, the elves can bring the full military might against Uzoldamut without fear of diplomatic reprisal. It's a good thing they can't see that anvil. The homeland's betrayal erases any concerns about digging further down. They breach a cavern, but build a wall to protect themselves from whatever's within it while they tunnel deeper still. There's little of value to be found so high up. Instead, they dig further and further, past another cavern that also gets walled off until they finally reach Warmstone. A solid layer of this means that they're above magma that necessitates some amount of caution, but more digging reveals a sea of the stuff near the central staircase. They clear out some space, channel out some floor to expose the burning hot magma, then build forges and smelters that'll harness it. It's over a hundred flights of stairs down from everything else, but that's gonna have to do for a while. Both this and the homeland's promise of demilitarization ironically come right after they've liberated enough weapons to not need to make any more of their own. Lying to the homeland about what they had helped make sure that the promise of demilitarization is worthless. They just don't understand. The adventurers split into a group of four close range fighters and four bone bolt shooting marks dwarves. They'll have to wait for metal armor until after the forges make axes for woodcutting. Indoc does the honors almost two years after arriving. It's time for long overdue beds, but though they're achieving some modest comforts and some basic sense of normalcy, their struggles are far from over. They still have to deal with rocky diplomacy with humans and elves, a mainland that hinders them with migrant stopping rumors, and the perpetual threats of bandits and worse in the lands around them. It's hard to sleep easy. The first step, though seemingly small, is wild monkeys stealing food that's now going to be stored behind doors down near the tavern to avoid it happening again. Other production will slowly make similar trips. Without fluxstone beneath the surface and without access to trade caravans from the homeland, steel is not happening. The area instead has plenty of tetrahedrite for copper and castorite to make bronze alloys in its place. There is iron here, but they dream of eventually wearing steel using fluxstone liberated from human settlements, so bronze will have to do for now to avoid exhausting that potential. There's also plenty of gold and platinum to stimulate the economy, though that will mean hauling heavy gold statues up over a hundred flights of stairs. Much lighter wood furnishes the hospital with buckets, splints, crutches, and more beds. Adventurers haven't roamed out in a while, but their earlier trips have finally started the economy off right. The dwarves have a proper underground kitchen, gem encrusted golden statues, and soap making facilities. But peace can't last. They need more leather, and the choices between the horses they've been bonding with and raising, and elvish animals they capture. The elves' attacks would have killed everyone without a second thought for a little minor stealing. A non-violent raid that just takes a few of the likely too plentiful animals is more than justified. The report about renewed raids since human adventurers to the outpost after none came for nearly a year. That can't be a coincidence. It's best to have the soldiers start training once again. The homeland's vicious rumors stop migrants despite the growing economy. On the other hand, Uzoldamad is doing so well that some human bard wants to join. But that's a big fat no. Bards are historically great spies after all, and a couple human outposts are still trying to find out who raided them so long ago. A dwarven bard can join though. Uh, they're followed by an entire performance troop days later. One glance around is enough for the goblins and elves to want to join. The homeland is stopping so many dwarves from joining. Well, one bard is inconspicuous and likely to be a spy, but this many? They can't all be bad. They can do the manual labor that migrants would have done and that soldiers are too busy to handle. Word spreads and so many more bards come to try and join. Their presence unfortunately keeps the soldiers at home and prevents them from roaming out lest the bards stage a mutiny. Keeping them contained and other threats out will be easier with a wall up on the surface. It's easy enough to drain a small pond nearby, but rerouting that river to the north will be much harder. It sure would be nice if there was a dwarven engineer to help, but migrants still aren't coming even though nearly two dozen bards, poets, and even consorts have chosen to move here. Screw the homeland. Screw their slow bureaucracy, their unwillingness to help. Their way of living is outdated. It's not fit for a dangerous frontier like this. The frontier has things like whatever this is. This shadowy creature is nicknamed Werroot in what's totally not a foreboding way. The piece it wants is definitely a utopia for everyone. It wanders into the tavern to perform, then to join the outpost. The homeland wouldn't approve. It's risky, dangerous. It shouldn't be allowed to join, but 
what if? What if it's shaped into a weapon, taught to bring a kind of glassy and eerily quiet peace to elves, humans, and maybe even the homeland? Werebrute quickly settles in like a normal colonist doing normal jobs, though they can't be assigned to anything specific like a dwarf normally can. The frontier also has whatever a Gorlack is, maybe it's also peaceful. It was definitely about to murder someone. A stone bridge adorns the front of the wall to keep enemies out. The river will stay there for now until more dwarf power can go to actually diverting it. The homeland's rumors continue to stop migrants from coming, but individual bards beg for the chance to join. They all get their own private rooms, while the elves, humans, and goblin entertainers are left to share a dormitory. It's harder to be a spy if you don't have your own private space to skulk about in and make notes or diagrams. The river is partially covered to stop enemies from swimming beneath the walls and finding their way in. That should keep unwanted enemies out, but the liaison arrives anyways. They're as unhelpful as always. The diplomacy they want is supposedly slow but steady going. The reality must be that they don't want Uzoldemont to succeed. The homeland even admits that they're being attacked from far to the northeast. They're so pathetic. With their continued betrayal and the precarious situation here looking no better, it's little wonder that Medtob is becoming mildly deranged. Perhaps that's why he starts a likely overly ambitious project that starts with Iron and corkscrews, blocks, and pumps. Human adventurers continue trying to join only to be turned away time and time again. They just can't be trusted. Paranoia is high. What if they're here to get revenge? A child tells a visiting goblin about a legendary scroll a tear looted from a nearby abandoned chapel a few years ago. It's probably fine. Expanded smelting down near the lava is bearing metallic fruit, though it will take a while before said fruit is ready to be harvested. Up top, dwarves start building fortifications to let archers shoot out at encroaching enemies, not only half finished before a challenge arrives to test them. It's more dirty elves. Wait, no one sees anything? Oh, it's in a single giant grizzly bear. Everyone gets into position and... Oh, that is a lot more than a single bear friend. The lever to lift the bridge is close enough that they get to pull it before the elves arrive, though that diagonal gap on either side can be walked through. Whoever designed this bridge is a traitor to all dwarves. Arstruck the Abomination isn't technically a soldier, but they throw themselves at the beast outside the walls to buy time for builders to actually blow block off that lifted bridge. If only the defenses had been finished in time. Wait, what? Who let the bridge down? Was it an elven spy? Vera is nearby as a likely candidate, or maybe it was M, the goblin dancer from the same performance troupe. They'll be dealt with soon, but only if the hamlet survives. It's nine dwarfs and Arshruk against... It's just nine dwarves against a few dozen animals and a dozen elves. A few soldiers push out and start marking kill after kill after kill against the elves and their beasts. Dwarves are outnumbered and more elvish wretches pushed into the base. Some civilians get caught, more soldiers try to clear them away, but chaos reigns. Blood and vomit decorate the landscape, but it is mostly elven. Their corpses litter the ground, and they've only managed to kill one dwarven soldier. Bronze armor and experienced hands see them through against beasts and elves alike. Eventually, only a few invaders are left. Soldiers chase giant warbears into the wilds before returning. With that threat sent off, the potential spies are interrogated. The goblin swears it was the elf and that they were about to come forward with that info, but that's what a dirty spy would say, so they're both set packing. The dead beasts are chopped up at the butcher station. The elves' attempts to destroy Uzoldamat ironically only make it stronger. It's not all good stuff though. Both Atir, the lone dwarf to die, and Arstruck, the creature, get a hero's burial. At the time, no one was sure if inviting Werud in was the right call, but he died a brave warrior's death. No one's quite sure what species he is, but he's buried amongst the dwarves, and they aren't the only ones that suffered. There are a lot of injuries amongst both some of the soldiers and some civilians caught on the surface. Those wretched elves. If they want to attack, let their brethren know what happened to their precious animals. Medtop's madness deepens. He mutters to himself as he begins fashioning bone helmets for the soldiers. They offer less protection than metal, but they're intimidating enough to hopefully make up for that. The last thing to do is handle all those corpses. The dumping ground outside the wall is getting awfully full, but even a pile on the ground is too good for elvish trash. They'll eventually be handled down below, near the metalworking facility facilities with a vertical shaft and a few iron hatch covers. A thief pilfers a legendary scroll. How abominable to resort to stealing, especially something that dwarves worked hard to liberate from an empty monastery. If that thief were around, they'd test out the garbage chute as punishment. It gets some locked hatches up top, connected to a pressure plate in the path that will hopefully automatically open up the chutes when anyone leaves after dumping their garbage. The bottom is carved out to expose it to lava, then the hatches are marked as dumping zones. An elf corpse can
can be used for testing. Then a kid decides to play make-believe, surrounded by shafts of lava all around them, liable to open up when anyone approaches. It doesn't go too badly though, though the automated pressure plate doesn't work quite as well as hoped. Dwarves often magically realize the space is now empty when they trigger the plate on the way up, then stop hauling whatever they were going to dump because the hatch isn't there for them to put it on. They stop hauling, dump their garbage in the pathway, then go to do something else. A lever and a little manual attention will have to do. It's time to start preparing for the biggest building project yet. The next elvish raid will only grow larger when they realize their sizable attack wasn't enough. A more long-term solution is needed to let adventurers roam out and actually begin besieging the elves while this outpost is safe without them. That involves another vertical shaft, though this one has an alternating sideways T structure and a nearby staircase reaching out to it. The bridge at the front is temporarily removed so a moat can be mined out around the outer wall. It's gonna ring the entire compound in time. The moat is deepened, even through an aquifer that proves really troublesome. They have to mine on an extra space in every direction to install waterproof walls. Progress is slow but steady for over a month before finally, migrants arrive despite the homeland's vicious warnings about this place. Things aren't peachy back home and an unpopular government saying you shouldn't is an invitation for some dwarves to think they really should. The traveling tales of Uzoldemont standing against the savage elves definitely helps. Perhaps it's little surprise that so many of the new migrants are good soldiers that happily join the squads, bringing them up to a total of 16 brave souls defending the village against human and elven threats alike. The other migrants can help with the moat, which still isn't even halfway done. The last of the aquifer is only walled off for long months after the whole process started. The continued work gives time for eight more migrants to show up and for thieves to make off with more important scrolls. The army moves their training grounds to the front gate to serve as a deterrent to these cretins. Any visitors will be searched on the way in and they'll be searched on the way out. With the aquifer walled off, miners can actually begin carving out the grounds between levels to make sure that the moat is sufficiently deep. It's actually not that bad that it's taking so long though, since the pipes needed to actually fill it up aren't even half done being made at the forge. Autumn arrives and more visitors from the homeland come soon after. The merchants are happy to trade with what's here, but Medtob rebuffs them. The diplomat tries to get them to open the gates and let traders in, but the dwarves are resolute. They fish out information about the elves being besieged by goblins, then push the liaison out. The dead here only fill their graves because the outpost received no help before. Ilrael fittingly makes a crown for the now largely independent settlement. More and more migrants arrive for dissidents that came to do some actual good in their lives. A minor workplace accident aside, and really it is awfully minor, the mode is... sorry, two minor workplace accidents aside, the mode eventually finishes almost nine months after construction started. Never build a moat near an aquifer if you aren't gonna fill it with water. Now it's time to turn all the magnetite from one gigantic vein into something that will help fill the moat properly. Soldiers flood the sideways tees mined out earlier to prepare for a breach into the cavern above. Civilians pour out to start walling the area off while soldiers push back some freaky bony birds. As they do, Elf sees the opportunity created by soldiers being so deep beneath the surface. Was it another spy telling them that the outpost would be vulnerable? Was it random chance? Soldiers pour back towards the front to try and make it before the enemy arrive at the gates with their... <laughs> They're giant chipmunks. The elven bowmen appear soon after, and there are a lot of them. What they lack in animal ferocity, they make up for in bow skill. Oh wait, they don't even have anything to make up for. Some of the soldiers are still far. The rest meet them on the bridge. The fighting is bloody. Gutted animals, eviscerated elves. Only a few dwarves fall despite that. Giant beasts flee, but though the front is fine, the same can't be said for the rest of the outpost. A giant chipmunk ran in in all the chaos and started to kill unprotected civilians. The front is an absolute bloodbath. Bad. More still were pushed into an empty moat. The soldiers clean up the remaining enemies, but the elves killed nearly a third of the village. The bastards targeted civilians when they realized they couldn't meet the might of a dwarven soldier. Everyone solemnly works to add more tombs for the recently departed after the originals went largely unfilled for so long. The only question left is whether the homeland endorsed this and sent the elves. But the troubles don't stop there. Some of the weird bony birds from the cavern sneak in and prey on defenseless victims in the hospital while the soldiers are topside. Perhaps the elves whispered crude wood magic down into the ground. Whatever the cause, the soldiers handle them while civilians head back down to wall off the cavern properly. The network of connected sideways tees is expanded upwards beyond that bottom cavern as the smiths finish all the piping needed. Next up is giant iron corkscrews. The tees are decorated with an alternating pattern of channels and the bottom one has a hole mined out to expose the lava beneath before a grate stops any dwarves from falling in. Then they build a screw pump capable of moving the lava up one Z level. It's pumped manually for now as a demonstration, but that'll change for the final product. The pattern alternates on the next level with a single tile of lava on the right for a screw pump to suck 
back up. The pattern continues upwards, one at a time, because they all have to be built on top of each other, a hundred times over. That slow and agonizing progress is interrupted only by walling off the human's barren consort in a cavern as they go out monster slay, prepping space in the outside of the compound to handle actually pouring the lava out, and Medtop's sanity finally failing him. The trials and tribulations of leading the outpost, of dealing with the homeland's betrayal, and carving dozens of bone helmets from the elvish enemy's once treasured giant pets is just too much for him. The giant pump stack continues to grow on his orders, but it isn't long before he refuses to imbibe, and eventually, he dies from dehydration before his final life project can be realized. He deserves a proper dwarven burial despite those mental health issues. His legacy can't be understated. It's thanks to him that everything started to come to fruition despite initially empty hands and hearts. The pump stack grows more without more interruptions until, finally, an entire year after it all started, windmills sprawl over the top to mark its completion. These feed power through axles, past gear assemblies, and down Z levels to pump stacks to automatically run them. It's all led up to the water flooded the bottom levels and turned magma into obsidian. Dwarves quickly work to drain the water, smooth the stone to stop it from happening again, then mine out all this obsidian. And now, with a flick of a lever, everything's engaged. The stack starts spitting lava up level after level. It's fed to a second stack for more control that ultimately feeds lava to an array of floodgates that ensure this lava flow can eventually be tapped in the future if it's needed elsewhere. Dwarves pull levers to open those floodgates and let magma flow out into the moat. It burns corpses and gear from the last elven attack as it slowly fills the entire ring. That should keep the base safe, which means that raids against the elves can begin properly. That's right, the dwarves are going to war. Magma forges begin working on armor once again. Dwarves need another 20 full sets of gear to equip a third and fourth squad of soldiers. Of course, they'll need their own bone helmets, though no one will do as good of a job as Medtop did. The original two squads get started raising the less populated outposts that they used to steal from, while the new squad begins to equip their gear and start preparing to train. It only takes them a few days to return with assurances that the elvish retreat is gone. 19 giant grizzly bears stood in their way, but none stand any longer, and the dwarves didn't lose anyone either. They even brought back a few animals to continue making more bone helmets. Then they can head off to burn the only other small elven town. All those attacks draw elven ire, and the largest force yet arrives to try and claim vengeance for their burned town. The bridge can't be closed before they arrive thanks to their stealthy approach, but the full army is here, equipped, and rides out over the magma. Corpses fall into the moat and smoke billows up. Fire follows, catches on the grass, then starts spreading. Dwarven soldiers push back the elves, but the fire continues to spread. Maybe the moat should have been ringed with stone floors. The new mayor Zafan is just clinging to the edge for dear life. He clambers to the side, then oh, oh no. Oh, he's completely fine. But there are a lot that aren't. The elves themselves are gone, but the fire continues to rage on and catches some dwarves who stand there and take it. Running from the flames would be showing fear and fire Fires can smell fear. Now everyone else smells charred dwarf instead. Trees burn and fall. It turns out they make a ton of noise even when no one's around to hear it. The fire at the front necessitates an entrance to the back so that everyone left can find safety back inside. Some of Medtop's finest bone helmets ever burn. Only a few died to elves, but lots died to the magma mode and ever-growing inferno. It's important to remember that all of this is not a result of horrible planning or bad decisions. It was Medtop's spiraling mental state that demanded all of this. Plus, there won't be anything to burn when the elves come back next. And besides, it's an intentional attempt to punish the elves by burning down all the trees in a wave that'll travel across the continent and back towards their home. It's sending a message. Send raiders here, and only burning winds will carry their ashes back. The squads are filled out with inexperienced soldiers that ought to train up some before they raid, but much like the land around is bathed in fire, they're trialed by it. All four squads head to raid a larger elven retreat. It takes them a few weeks to return, and a few dwarves did lose their lives in the fight, but they do return victorious. Battle-hardened hands should make quicker work of the next town. The campaign is well underway, and by the end of it, no elf will be left standing alive. Uzuldamat came from nothing, but now stands strong as quite literally the lone place where grass and life grows in an otherwise barren, ash-filled wasteland that they had no part in causing. The treacherous journey drove some to insanity, some to tombs, and some to magma, but more still stood strong and now purged the world of elven taint. This has been my largest dwarf Fortress video because I had so much fun raiding and building it all. I hope you enjoyed watching it. If you did, make sure to subscribe so you catch my next challenge for Dwarf Fortress, and then check out a video I made on Farthest Frontier. It's an amazing city builder, and I smell a challenge in that game coming up.